Chitral is the name, uh, then um, a princely state, and now it's just a part of the northwest frontier. Uh, that's my father-in-law uh, in a um, cartoon drawn uh, while he was in Karachi in India uh, by a U.S. Coast Guard artist who was famous before the war and was uh, en enlisted in the Coast Guard and then uh, even more famous after the war. Uh, to put together who he was, his signature is very difficult there, but once I finally figured it out and put it into Google, like many of the other things, with search engines now, it's possible to, to learn things that you could never hope to, to do otherwise. Um, uh, uh, let me tell you, uh, some of the people who wrote covers, uh, uh, comments on the back cover are Admiral Harry Train, who I knew after the war, um, he was uh, the NATO commander of the, in Atlantic. I knew him after the war as a volunteer in the American Catch Society, and he agreed to write the, uh, the, the first of the comments on the back cover. His father was the chief of naval intelligence in World War II and was therefore my father's ultimate boss. Small world. Um, Joe Callow is a, is a, um, a reservist who has written several books on the Navy. Barnett Schechter is a friend who has also written his, uh, books about history. And uh, Jed Williamson, my, uh, who he and I have both been presidents of a little college up in northern Vermont. And uh, he is a noted Himalayan climber and past president of the American Alpine Club and very interested in th this area of the world, of course. Uh, five overlapping stories uh, here, and I'll try to touch on each of them. And if we have a chance to talk a little longer, uh, you might ask uh, me to, to uh, elaborate on them. There's probably too much elaboration anyway, but I have to tell you that some of the things you'll see and some of the pictures you'll see here had to be eliminated from the book uh, for reasons of length and also because the, the Naval Institute Press wanted to have only original photos, and some of the photos that I will show you on these images are historic photos. Um, Anyhow, so the, the story of the discovery, recovery, and study of, uh, that is, is just one piece of this. And uh, for those who are interested in history, and uh, that, that would be enough just to, to look at the details there. A family story, of mainly of my father's family, but the interlocking connections with my own family's background and the other people that you'll meet in this, uh, literally, um, Almost every important person that you can imagine in World War II is about within two degrees of separation from the people that you see in this story, including Hitler, Hirohito, and the rest. It's just amazing. Naval intelligence, this is uh, one of the few, maybe the only intelligence officer of World War II of all the thousands who were trained. There were something like 1,500 trained in naval air intelligence the only one whose story has been preserved and reasonably um, complete and uh, has ever been told is this story. And that's just by accident. Um, there are some other stories about naval intelligence, as you know, uh, the story of the code breakers and so forth, and general stories about naval intelligence, but this personal story, I think, is interesting. The, most th the, the thing that sold the book to the Naval Institute was the unique trip, which would, was, um, we'll come back to later, and that's the trip in the Jeep. And um, it al also offers us an opportunity to think of the great game, the game that began for control of Central Asia for various reasons. It was the Silk Route, it was uh, Alexander's route to the Indian Ocean, the ocean he called it, he didn't, it wasn't called the Indian Ocean, and it has been since then and up to the present time an area of intense concern for so many countries and will be forever. Central Asia, the great game. Proceed to Peshawar um, is based on the wartime papers of my father-in-law, including only thing that was known about it uh, until the rest of the papers were found was a letter that he wrote in November 1943 from Peshawar as he was in the middle of the trip, half of the trip completed wrote a letter to his wife, passed the censor. There was some stuff in that. In fact, I, when I found that in family papers, I transcribed it and um, did a bit of editing of it, uh, cleaning up the language from what my mother-in-law had uh, uh, tried to understand, and uh, it, it did a little bit with it and sold it to the Naval Institute Press, um, which never published it, because it was probably not publishable at that point. Uh, but then, uh, because the rest of the papers 
three foot lockers of family papers were found in my sister-in-law's attic as she was about to go into a retirement home and wondered if my wife would like to come and take home any family pictures. And I looked, and I, I drove that day uh, uh, to Pennsylvania and looked at the attic and I saw all these photographs and uh, naval orders and things and I just scooped it all up and put it in the back of the car and then spent the next uh, several years sorting it and figuring out what it was. Uh, so uh, there, uh, some of them are called autograph letters, others are type reports, and so forth. And it's all now at the Naval Institute. I've saved the, f the, family, p uh, the family stories, uh, go back to into the 1870s of scrapbooks and so forth. But the, the stories of this trip and my father-in-law's experiences are now in the special collections at the Naval Institute in Annapolis. Uh, the trip, which is the focus of the book, uh, was um, uh, departed Karachi, India on 12 November 1943. They arrived in Peshawar by train. He arrived in Peshawar, joined two other, um, a, a British intelligence officer and an American Army intelligence officer. And they traveled through the Northwest Frontier Province, through, through the northern areas of Swat, Deer, the Lawari Pass to Chitral, back in Peshawar, 23rd November, and then they went down through north and south Waziristan to Quetta in Baluchistan, and were back in Karachi um, by train from, from Quetta uh, in, uh, just a month later. Now, isn't it true that every naval, in, naval officer is an intelligence officer? Some do it better than others, some are more interested in it than others, but every one of them is always on the lookout. Uh, med medical intelligence is real intelligence. And uh, the best way to understand that and how I got interested in intelligence and the bridge between medical intelligence and, and real intelligence is when I read Dr. Maturin's uh, story, fictional story, in uh, Patrick O'Brien's novels. And that was what led me actually to get an invitation to speak at the National Reconnaissance Office on this subject a few years ago. I gave the keynote address to the Navy Day there. Now the great game, of course, uh, didn't didn't exist by name for Alexander. He spoke, uh, what, Greek or Macedonian, uh, but um, he was the first European to um, invade uh, India, and he went across the same territories that my father went through. He didn't go through the Khyber Pass because he was smart. He got some guidance and he went north of the Khyber when uh, the Khyber was very, very heavily defended even at that time. And he uh, got into Chitral and all the same places. Uh, Ivan the Great uh, expelled the mongrels and then began to move south. And uh, there's the great game starting. The great game intensified during the time of uh, uh, Lord Curzon. Uh, he arrived in, uh, as viceroy in 1899, but he'd been there before, and he tried to get into Chitral, the same route that my father did. Couldn't make it. Several other people tried to do it, and uh, that was, uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Others who uh, were involved in this area, of course, was uh, Rudyard Kipling, who, who coined the term, the great game, based on a, a phrase that had been put into a letter about 30 years before that by a man named Arthur Connolly, who was a British uh, adventurer, captain, and was uh, held at that point in prison in Bukhara, now in Uzbekistan. And uh, he, he wrote that this is a great game, he wrote to somebody, this is a great game you're about to enter, he thought he was in a great game. The mayor had him beheaded and he's buried there somewhere and you could, in the main courtyard. But uh, the term was picked up by Rudyard Kipling and he used it over and over in his novel, Kim, uh, which is, the Kim is the, 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 the name that has been used over and over, Kim Philby, Kim Roosevelt. Uh, Kim became popular as a result of, of Kipling's novel and Kipling popularized the name great game for, for the contest for Central Asia focused in Afghanistan along the same border between Afghanistan and India that we're talking about here. Winston Churchill had been there and my father referred to, to Winston Churchill's first book, uh, Malakand, in his letter back to his wife just to let her know where he was. The letters all had to pass the censor so he had to use terms like that and a lot of nicknames and, and um, odd little ways of, of expressing things that would pass the censor and that led to some difficulty for me in trying to figure out what it was all about. Other people who appear in this story and some of them met by my 
my father-in-law. There's Lord Wavell on the left, Auchinleck in the center. Both of my, my father met both of them, my father-in-law, and Lowell Thomas, who had been there 20 years before and traveled along some of the same route uh, from the south to the Khyber Pass, not, not in the northern part at all. The USSR continued to play the great game even after uh, they said they were giving it up. They secretly planned to set the east ablaze, said Lenin. Uh, Stalin actually called it Bolshai Igra, the great game, and uh, that's the name of a Russian freighter in that day, and, and um, um, set the east ablaze. They planned to do it indirectly by activating the Communist Party of India, the CPI. Looking ahead to the great game, the struggle for the control of Central Asia is now uh, the struggle for gas and oil and access to the Indian Ocean as it always has been. The five Stan Republics are still on the border and uh, you know them, Kakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, the largest, uh, well, because uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan is probably the largest. Anyhow, uh, all the other countries are involved in this, right? Still, to this day, Iran, Russia, China, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and Pashtuns on both sides of the border, uh, the Durand Line. The stated purposes of this uh, trip that my father-in-law was on, for Gordon Enders, the Army Intelligence Officer, it was uh, to be a tour of the frontier in Baluchistan from Chitral to Quetta with the idea of making it clear to the American legation in Kabul what our frontier problems and our ideas and policy in dealing with them and the Afghans. That was in a secret message from the intelligence officer in Quetta to the intelligence officer in Karachi and copies uh, that I were preserved in, in, in these papers that I found. Uh, a naval intelligence officer uh, was to be added for a unique opportunity for background to use in any reports emanating from the U.S. sources in Kabul or Delhi. And the reason for that, I may not, I, I'll get back to that later, but I think that really my father-in-law was put on the trip because Gordon Enders, who engineered it and who always dreamed of it, um, was a windbag. And nobody could believe him for sure. Uh, so uh, in order to have somebody uh, be, be able to tell the truth about the trip, they, they put uh, my father-in-law on it, and how he got on the trip and how he was identified is another piece of the story which we may, we may not get to. Anyhow, more about the purpose of the Northwest Frontier trip. Intelligence uh, officers are always encouraged to do things that they think may be useful. That's why you go to intelligence school. They don't tell you all the details, and if they tell you, they tell it uh, they tell it uh, verbally, right? They don't put it in the orders. Very, very rare. So, uh, other problems that, uh, that he emerged as I read the reports and I read what he did and what I knew was going on at the time, um, the problems, of course, with the, the border tribes and how Britain dealt with them, they were very different. Each of the princely states had its own history um, the Wali of Swat, the Nawab of Deer, and the Maytower of Chitral, they all stand for king in different languages. They all hated each other, even though they were related. The Northwest Frontier Province was largely governed by the Khan family, and still is, and the Pashtun tribes, the Afridis, Momads, Wazirs, the, the people you read about in the paper right now to this day, sub-tribes, the Maliks, Mul and all of these things, they all had their own laws. It was called Pashtun Wali. It, it's, it's not lawless. The U.S. newspapers call them lawless, but they're not lawless. They're just different. They don't pay any attention to Pakistan law, uh, but they have, uh, they have their own way of doing things, and it mostly uh, it takes place in, in um, conferences called jurgas and loya jurgas. And what the British learned was to go to the loyal jurga, let them figure out what they want, and then enforce it impartially enforce it, and that worked, and that's what, that's what my father-in-law saw. Some in England believed that India would soon become independent, possibly divided into two or three parts, as it was, and the U.S. would or should become involved in this part of the world and protect British interests that would still be there even after Britain officially left the area, British uh, money would still be there and commerce, and it was important for that to be protected. So, all of the usual intelligence operations um, are involved here. Uh, I either saw them in my father-in-law's reports or in other people's reports, and here they are. 
geography, people, cities and towns, arms and intentions. They make a lot of weapons there. They make them very good and they make them very cheap. Ammunition. Uh, transportation possibilities, opportunities for roads, railroads and air going across the border into western China across here. Power, minerals, storage facilities, enemies and potential enemies. This was a war of course. This was the war against um, Rommel was expecting to, to get to this. If he had crossed the, if he had gotten to Cairo, he would have gone after that all the way to India. So they had landmines set up in this country that my father-in-law went through and he describes the landmines that were laid for, for Rommel. And for Gordon Enders, the man we talked about, the army man, uh, it was, it was a, a, a dream of a lifetime. He'd been born in Iowa, but he had grown up as the son of missionaries on the border of India, the same as the fictional Kim uh, had lived in. Almost the same, a generation later than Kim. And um, uh, uh, then Kipling. Uh, Kipling was writing about a generation earlier, so it's two generations later. But it's the same area and the same people, and he really wanted to do this trip. He wanted to, to recreate Kim. Um, now, he was called a blowhard by, uh, by uh, uh, Rod Engert, who I spoke with, uh, 50, uh, class of 50 at Yale, OSS, whose father had been the uh, chief of mission in Kabul in World War II. And as a young man, he joined the OSS, and he knew that, that, uh, Rod, that uh, Enders, very similar names, but Enders is the army man, uh, Engert is the diplomat that uh, Enders was a, uh, a blowhard. And the OSS separately uh, uh, called, him an, uh, called him a bag of wind. Now, the, there was war between the OSS and uh, G2, Army Intelligence, so you have to accept that there would, there would not be nice things said, but um, I also know that, uh, that my father-in-law said he was a, he was a man uh, who had uh, no particular modesty and uh, talking was, uh, was one of his uh, great virtues. Uh, and he had some other things that he held back, uh, but, but you could read it. And uh, for Bromhead, the, uh, the British knight, uh, hereditary uh, baronet, uh, fifth baronet, um, uh, he, was, he had to be the bag man. You had to give tribute in those days, and probably still today. I mean, what's the CIA doing with all the money that goes to, to uh, the, the president of um, Afghanistan? It's bag money, and it is necessary there in order to lubricate uh, the uh, forces that you want to have work for you instead of the, them being lubricated by the other side. I can't say that for sure, but I do know that, that all of Bromhead's predecessors as political agents in that area, uh, uh, it's well recorded uh, how much they used to have to give to the Maytower of Chitral and to the Wally of Swat and so forth. So I just assume that that was part of what was carried in the Jeep. Can't prove it. This is the Durand line. You see the Durand line uh, heavy there. Afghanistan on the left and uh, what was India then. All of that was India at the time. Now it's Pakistan. Uh, this was the border also between the far eastern area of the, of the, um, of the US and uh, the, the, uh, the Joint Command. The Far Eastern area it was called FE in uh, Naval Intelligence, and ME, the Middle Eastern Command, which was in Cairo, and this was as far away as you could get from either uh, base. Nobody paid any attention to it because there was no war going on there, and it was an area where uh, Gordon Enders, the Army guy, operating with, with credentials on both sides. He was credentialed to G2 in India, and he was also credentialed as the military attache in Kabul, he could operate on both sides of the border and nobody paid any attention to him. Uh, my father-in-law was a socialite, no doubt about it, and that's the kind of people who got into the OSS and got into naval intelligence. You couldn't get there any other way. You had to be an Ivy League or something like that, and uh, it just happened. Uh, he was extremely wealthy. His father, his father had uh, is said, gave a million dollars to each of his kids when they got married, just for starters. My mother-in-law didn't have any uh, particular money, but she came from a, a Philadelphia Society background, and um, it made it possible for us to ha have, have these papers, have this experience to talk about. 
This is the, the four, their four children during the, uh, just before the run-up to the war. The war was about to start uh, the Second World War at that time. Still a, a dreamy life there in Haverford, Pennsylvania. There he was in the Navy. He shouldn't have ever gotten in the Navy. Uh, he was colorblind, but his father-in-law uh, was an ophthalmologist and uh, was a very famous one, the head of ophthalmology at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, could write letters. And so even at that age, he was then uh, uh, 40 years old, uh, managed to get in the Navy, uh, survived uh, basic training and so forth. And, uh, you know, they were very patriotic in those. Um, how did he get into naval intelligence? Well, uh, he had two personal connections with Vincent Astor, who was in charge of what they called the room. That was Roosevelt's uh, st uh, study of uh, intelligence operations at Rockefeller Center, uh, the Rockefeller owned building in New York City. He had two connections to Vincent Astor, some connections to Roosevelt. There's Vincent Astor on the right uh, with his Navy, uh, Navy uniform on. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, that's uh, Brooke Astor uh, before she died. Um, there's Harry Train, uh, his father uh, in the upper right hand corner. Uh, Zacharias, um, um, uh, Ellis Zacharias, um, who wrote his biography after the war, was the man who wanted to be chief of naval intelligence but never was. He got a tombstone promotion to rear admiral because he had a, a commanded a couple of. Uh, uh, but, uh, battleships during the war and got the Legion of Merit and that was good enough to get you a promotion in those days when you retired. Uh, so he's referred to as uh, Zacharias, but he was a thorn in the side of every Office of Naval Intelligence chief because he spoke Japanese, he understood the whole, the, the whole uh, operation, and he was never satisfied not being the chief himself. Both Train and Zacharias spoke at my father's graduation from the Advanced Intelligence School, and uh, he was one of the, my father-in-law being a great singer and, and uh, also a smooth fellow, uh, I'm sure met both of them, but they're both in his notes, uh, the program. That's, old, that's uh, old Navy there, the lower right-hand corner, it's long gone now from Washington. Um, Naval intelligence is good, to, <laughs> it was great. He, my father-in-law never expected this. He, he thought he was going to be, uh, you know, like doing the OSS and, and uh, some of his, uh, uh, some of the other people he knew. Many OSS people passed through his uh, door and he called them um, Lincoln, uh, uh, Freeman's friends. That was the, the code word for it. Uh, in fact, his next door neighbor was actually a Marine uh, Lieutenant in the OSS, next door neighbor. Uh, they all passed through Karachi and my father-in-law was just stuck there, but he had a good time. An invitation to meet the governor and Lady Dow, there they are in Karachi, lots of drinking, tennis, uh, you never can tell how, there he is in, a, in, a, in his white uniform taken by somebody else. Uh, the Iranian council's resident in October 1944, by this time my father-in-law was the the uh, head of na uh, the Naval Liaison Office in Karachi, that's what they call the uh, the office, there was no attache because there was only one attache for the whole British Empire and he was based in London. The, the operations uh, in uh, which would now be the naval attache type things uh, were then headed by naval liaison officers, that's what it's called, A-L-U-S-L-O in the, in the acronym. And uh, there he is uh, at the, Nice day at the races, looking at the uh, Indus River. It flows out uh, into the Indian Ocean through Karachi. Uh, the orders, uh, amazingly, the orders, I, I have the original secret letter there uh, written that I quoted from uh, explaining why the trip needs to be done. At least this is in the open, um, even though it's secret. You ne never know about how secret papers will be. But this is the, uh, what I quoted for here, quoted here. Now. The three officers who made the trip are listed here. I've told about Enders, uh, Zimmerman, and Bromhead. There are others who were mentioned in this letter, briefly, just so you understand it. Uh, the governor uh, was Sir George Cunningham, and all those letters after his name, and he was the guy who finally figured out for the British how to uh, pacify the border and keep the, uh, the Pashtuns uh, in line. And just by not trying to do it, by being a help, being a partner with them. 
very brave guy. He would just walk anywhere, no matter what. the bullets are flying, and 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 uh, that's the sort of thing that people admire there. Being on the scene, on the ground. Whether you're afraid or not, you don't show it. Uh, Francis Smith, uh, who was a, um, I have to say, he was probably a jerk. He had been there for a long time. Uh, he was probably a naval officer in, in um, Mufti, uh, a, a, a naval intelligence officer probably before the war and then pops up as a, as a um, lieutenant commander. He later became the Kumshaw artist, the bag man for the, the, the head Navy guy, uh, Commodore Milton Miles in, in China. And Miles just loved him. He, by this time, he had gotten fired with an, in, with an uh, unsatisfactory fitness report, my father's boss, um, and had been moved out and was looking for a job. And Miles picked him up and put him into, into Calcutta. Uh, and and uh, he did a wonderful job there, more of the same. He, he ran um, a, um, a woman, a strange woman, uh, as an intelligence uh, officer and did all sorts of crazy things. And they had a, uh, they had a, a real battle. The CNO himself got involved into it, looking at the ex at the expense accounts in Karachi under uh, under uh, Smith. Um, angered, I've mentioned before, um, and uh, we. He's also a liar. He he was born um, uh, a uh, you know, a Russian citizen, and he hid the nature of his birth. Uh, managed to get all the way through and retire with an OB from the from the. Um, uh, from the diplomat, the U.S. diplomatic service layer was involved. I just discovered in, in this new book by Hugh Wilford, America's Great Game. He appears in there after he retired from the State Department as a as a um, undercover guy for the uh, uh, for the uh, CIA, and and he was completely unbelievable. And his fitness report said that over and over again. But there he was. He made it to the first. He was the first U.S. Uh, um, not ambassador at that point, it was a minister to um, Kabul. And um, he, he got the, I, I said Obi, but he got the CBE. And, uh, and uh, so sometimes you can just drift along, uh, not telling the truth, but make it believable enough and uh, make it interesting enough and, and, it, and it works. Uh, John R. Harris uh, was a Central Liaison officer in Karachi, mentioned in the letter, and uh, the one that I never, one of the very few people that, I, that appear in the whole story and all the letters and everything that I never could identify was who was I.B. Quetta. He appears in the State Department documents also, uh, but never named. And uh, then there were other people, obviously, there were literally, by the time the trip is over, there were hundreds of people including many British generals, and, uh, and then later after that, uh, uh, everybody from Mountbatten to, uh, to, to uh, all the people, OSS, everybody, knew about the trip, but it wasn't interesting, you know? Nobody got hurt, they didn't discover anything that was unexpected, it was an interesting trip, and so it never appeared in the records. And all these reports and everything, they're gone. Uh, but um, anyhow. Not mentioned in the letter, but others who were involved in the planning was uh, Rex Benson. He was the uh, British at military attache in Washington, and he gave a card of introduction uh, to um, Gordon Enders, the army man, and Enders presented it to the governor of the Northwest Frontier Province, and that was two years before uh, the trip. And it took two years of uh, kind of pestering, I'm sure, before it finally happened. Rex Benson was the cousin and uh, very, very close friend, family members uh, and, uh, at Oxford at the same time with uh, Sir Stuart Menges, M-E-N-Z-I-E-S. Stuart Menges was the head of the British Secret Service. He was a man called M, and of course he becomes C in, in, uh, in the books, uh, what's the book? Uh, uh, what? Bond. Bond, yeah. Uh, the guy who wrote Bond also worked for MI6, and so he just took Menzies M and turned it into C. Right. Uh, and Rex Benson, head of the Benson Bank at the time of the Second World War, received the Military Cross in the First World War, all sorts of stuff going on, but he was the superb uh, chief of uh, mission for the, for the Brits in, in Washington. Uh, Clarence Macy, the uh, American Consul, and the Honorable Charles Thayer, who was the guy who put it all together for my father to go on the trip, 
Thayers, uh, the Thayers and, uh, and uh, the Aldriches and the Astors were all very close. And my father uh, was a, a very close friend of the Thayers and of, uh, of, uh, of, of Mal Aldrich. Um, and after the war, we, we, know, we learned that also. Two more who met the travelers on the trip were uh, the um, Viceroy of India and L Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Hay, who was the commissioner, they called him the governor of Baluchistan. Uh, the, the trip, um, this is the end of the trip, the last picture on the trip. Uh, Major, Sir Benj Major Bromhead is on the, on the side there. It's a hereditary, he's not really a knight. I called him a knight in the book. The, that's, that's, I've been told that that's not quite true. He wasn't a knight, he was a, he was a, a sir. And, uh, but um, to me, not being a British, I didn't understand the difference. Um, anyhow, uh, so uh, there's Gordon Enders on the right uh, wearing his uh, uh, bomber jacket and his uh, driver who, who, who joined them in, in uh, Peshawar on the southern part of the trip. And my father-in-law took the picture. Uh, there's Ingrid, I mentioned before, the, the, the liar. He was, um, uh, his mother was a, a Hungarian, uh, Jewish doctor. He hid his birth uh, record and called himself by a new name and the State Department let him get away with all of that. It's really quite amazing. Um, uh, there's uh, Charles Thayer in the lower photograph. Um, he later went on to uh, be one of the four or five really great experts on Russia and uh, was, uh, at, at, as I say, the, the first guy. He graduated from West Point. He's a, he's a Philadelphia guy, but uh, didn't follow the usual route. And there's uh, 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 Wavell and Auchinleck in the lower right-hand corner. There's Rex Benson. I mentioned him before. Uh, some of those who learned about the trip when it was underway. Um, uh, Kurt Windsor's uh, stepson, at the time the trip was going on, his stepson was Franklin Roosevelt's grandson. Gives you some idea how the connections went in those days. He was my he was junior to my father in, in age, but he was his desk officer, the Far Eastern desk officer in Washington at ONI. And Gene Markey, I, I, I completely missed Gene Markey until the book was almost ready to go because my father-in-law mentioned Markey only twice in, in his letters, just, just, just mentioned it. Once he said that Markey had been married to, uh, I forget her name, uh, Joan Bennett's sister and Hedy Lamar. Well, I looked up, uh, Joan Bennett's sister, and there was no such thing about Markey. So I just set it aside, didn't pay any attention to it, until I looked up Hedy Lamar, and sure enough, he did marry Hedy Lamar, and there's a whole huge story that appears about him. He later became one of the, he, his friend John Ford, John Ford, you know, the movie director, who was wounded at Midway, sent to Midway to film it. Uh, he and John Ford were very close friends, and, uh, and <laughs> it's really amazing. Goes on and on. Uh, uh, Patrick Hurley, uh, who was um, uh, traveling in the area right after the trip, and uh, I'm sure learned about it, is shown here with Milton Miles, who I mentioned before on the left-hand side. There is the one who hired uh, Com Smith uh, when uh, when uh, Smith got fired from Karachi. Uh, others who could have learned of the trip, and I, th and I argue probably did, uh, Menzies and Donovan did not learn of it, uh, Wiley probably did, and Mountbatten certainly could have because uh, Mountbatten and, and Markey were very, very close. Mount ba Mountbatten's, one of Mountbatten's biographies was actually written by Gene Markey, the ex-husband of Hedy Lamar, af and after the war. Uh, in the shadows on the trip are all these people precedents for it. The Roosevelt sent a, a mission to Tibet about a year before that to try to bring Tibet into the American orbit uh, for the Second World War. And uh, the, the trip fell apart because uh, uh, Miles and others thought that it would not be a good idea because the Chinese, even though the Chinese were pretty weak at that time, they still had their eyes on Tibet. And uh, the idea of setting up, a, for instance, a, a radio station in Tibet would be bad news, and so they pulled the mission out. But Roosevelt, there's the little, the little guy on the left-hand side there is in the uh, book about this trip. 
Um, and uh, he, he, that's President Dalai Lama. He's all grown up now, my age. Uh, but at that time, he, he received the mission and received a, a framed photograph of Roosevelt in a silver frame uh, over the opposition of the State Department. Um, and while all this trip is going on, very interesting. And then it, after that trip is over now, my father-in-law's trip starts. Major Gordon Enders, I mentioned all this stuff about him already. He had written two books one of which called himself an American Kim. There it is, Rudyard Kipling's Kim and Gordon Ender's book. Gordon Ender's was the first and probably the only one who ever got a passport as an official member of the Tibetan Senate, appointed by the Dalai Lama, right? There he is. I, I describe him as almost oriental looking in, in my book. And I think you see what I mean? He could, he could easily pass. Uh, Benjamin Bromhead is just barely mentioned in, in the book, uh, but d digging into his family history through the internet and through the peerage and so forth, I learned all sorts of stuff about him. Most interesting thing I didn't know from this study, but only when I give talks about it, uh, one of the fellows said, Bromhead, that's kind of an interesting thing. I think Bromhead is the name of the guy in Zulu. Huh, Bromhead's great uncle, buried in Allahabad, earned the Victoria Cross in South Africa, and the movie is called Zulu, and it was the, it was the first movie that Michael Caine starred in. <laughs> That's the family. There's the Bromhead's estate to this day. There we are, Zulu, the real, the real one, and Michael Caine, small world. On his way to Afghanistan in November 1941, he crossed into Afghanistan on Pearl Harbor Day uh, in, uh, in Asia. It was 8 December 1941. Uh, Gordon Enders, on his way there, stopped by to have dinner with the commander-in-chief, then later the viceroy, and was um, uh, talking up, I'm sure, the idea of doing the trip. Uh, the most famous explorer of uh, Asia at that time, uh, probably, uh, was um, Oral Stein, and he was dying um, just before the trip started, dying in Kabul, Afghanistan. Oh, I ought to mention, the, the conferences that are going on at that time were the Moscow Conference, just before it, of foreign ministers, the Cairo Conference one, the Tehran Conference, Cairo Conference number two, going on at the same time the trip was going on. And since all of these were going on, I thought it was maybe they were connected in some way. No, not at all. The trip was completely independent of it. But um, Bill Donovan was all, his, his, while Bill Donovan was flying all over, he was going to all these different places, and I thought he must be involved in it too, but it wasn't. Zimmerman's orders, shown here, amazingly preserved. Nothing in it, it just says proceed to Peshawar and uh, other such places, other such places, with pr transportation to be provided by the U.S. Army. Never mind that the transportation would sometimes be on donkeys, sometimes be on, on uh, horseback, and sometimes be in jeeps, and, and uh, sometimes being provided by the British in armored cars and so forth. Very, very vague, as intelligence officers often get. There's the route map that goes all the way from Peshawar in the center. The little parrot's beak here. We'll come back to that later. The parrot's beak that goes, pokes into Afghanistan, uh, just on the north side of that is where the Tora Bora Caves are located, okay? Uh, the northern area, Chitral, you can see how the, 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 that little peninsula of, of uh, Afghanistan that extends off to the side is just above there. The highest mountain uh, in, the, uh, in the range uh, is there. And then Quetta at the lower end of it, uh, there are something like 12 tunnels the railroad goes through to get from, from Quetta and Baluchistan back to Karachi. Uh, they departed uh, Karachi on the 12th November in an air-conditioned car and uh, some, some other stuff there. You can read it faster than I can. I talk too much anyway. But uh, anyhow, so there he, he's crossing the Atok River. Uh, I was crossing the Indus River at Atok. That was the same place that 
uh, Alexander crossed it, Alexander's memoirs, um, uh, the memoirs written by uh, people who went with him, Aristotle, of course, and others like that. It was a ver very famous crossing place. There, there is somebody, uh, not, not him, at the Peshawar Railroad Station. Uh, they went up the, the, the trip to Swat, up the Swat River, past the fort where, and this is in his, my father-in-law's words, for six days the British garrison was imprisoned, and when Gunga Din, fictional, but that's what he said, uh, came down to the Swat River to get water. They could only heliograph from the fort at this stage. Churchill as a sub-lieutenant fought in these mountains and Auchinleck in 1935 was stationed there also. My father-in-law must have been thrilled by the opportunity to be crossing historic country like this. But he told it in a very, uh, you know, just humdrum way. There he is standing with the, uh, the Wally of Swat and uh, the Malacan, uh, uh, the Valley of the Swat River. Uh, approaching the top of the pass, and there he is at the top of the Luwari Pass. Uh, that's Benji, as he called him, in the background. And that, uh, that's my father-in-law standing looking at the camera. He doesn't understand uh, army uniforms, but that's what he had to wear. At the Luwari Pass, uh, after squeezing between a stone wall on one side and the edge of the trail on the other, which sometimes dropped, and you've seen, if, if any of you have been to the Himalayas, you know what it's like. I mean, you just never know. The, the, uh, the story of Wavell's trip as a lieutenant to this, to this area, he was following a, a, a British colonel on horseback, and the colonel disappeared. And they thought that would be the end of him. They went up there and looked down, and, and he, only about 20 feet, the, 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 it goes 1,000 feet down from, the, from this very road, goes 1,000 feet down to the river. They found the, the horse and the, and, the, and the colonel was about 20 feet down there. They hauled him back up again, a little bloody, not the worst for wear, and the colonel gets back on again and rides on. And that's what that road was like until they improved it a little bit. Now, the movies that my father-in-law took show what an incredible thing it was. They took a rope along, and they, there are a lot of other people around here. You don't see them in the pictures at all. And with using the rope, they pulled the Jeep back over and over again onto the, onto the trail, <laughs> onto the trail, particularly on the north side. As they say, going down on the north side, getting, getting out to see what's ahead. I think they walked most of the way. But Gordon Enders, who had been a pilot, as a 17-year-old guy, he had been a pilot in World War I, been shot down at least once, maybe twice, given up for dead, like Hemingway. Um, uh, he was absolutely fearless. He was a pilot for Chiang Kai-shek, right? and he could drive this Jeep. And you watch him in the movies driving the Jeep. It's really crazy. I'm going to have the movies transformed into a, into a real film someday. So there's a, just one difficulty on, on the zigzag. And there is Terry Schmier, the highest mountain in the... Hindu Kush, and I talked to the fellow who was on that climb, the first ascent of it in 1950. He's an old man now, and he remembers all of these things that I'm talking about. He, he tell, told me stories about Benji Bromhead. Connections right to the present. Um, that's uh, the Norwegian route uh, went up there. That's the route that my, the fellow that I talked to on the phone, British Colonel Cur Tony Strether. He fell on K2 and was, was, was uh, caught by, on the rope there, the famous rescue uh, uh, on K2. Uh, now they're back at uh, Peshawar again and uh, he describes the trip uh, in the, uh, up to the tribal territory, many block houses in the past, the Khyber site on, on the right. This is the same uh, scene, very few Americans had seen it up to this point. Uh, Enders had crossed it, Engert had crossed it, Lowell Thomas had crossed it and very, very few others. Uh, until my father-in-law did it. Uh, that afternoon, after they went to Peshawar, that afternoon the governor of the Northwest Frontier Provinces had a garden party to meet the Viceroy. Major Bromhead arranged for Enders and me to be invited. It was a grand affair, a beautiful setting on the government house lawn. Still there. Still there. All the Mullocks, the tribal leaders from the surrounding country were there, along with important Britishers of the community. That's the letters that he uh, sent home on 6 December, he typed it, and my wife retyped it, and, um, uh, well, that, it's the typing that was done by my, it was written in handwriting, but, but he, my wife, my, my mother-in-law retyped it with all the errors and so forth. The viceroy had heard we'd been up to the Luari in, to Chitral in a Jeep, so he came over to where we were, where we were standing and asked all about it. Enders did the talking as he has a flair for it, and modesty is not one of his virtues. 
There's the dance card at the Peshawar Club that night. Uh, my father-in-law had no dancer's card and he loved to dance. And I, I don't know whether he was worn out from the day, worn out, but he got a very bad cold by the time it was all over and I think he might have not feeling so well. But up to the point where he was traveling in armed cars run by the British, he was keeping track of the time to the minute and the mileage to the tenth of a mile as a good intelligence officer and good uh, engineer always would. Now, uh, there were over 150 pictures that he took on the trip. With a borrowed camera, he didn't know whether a single one would work. Every single one was a keeper. Every one. And every one is labeled on the back in his very difficult to read handwriting, but uh, they, they were labeled and, and so I, I wrote some of, the, some of the labels on here. But th this is the Paris Beat. Those are the Tora Bora Caves up there. And uh, Tony Strether, the mountaineer that I mentioned, remembers that also. Those, that's where Tora Bora was. He had been there long before Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was there right after 9-11, 2001. Uh, my father-in-law was there in 1943. And he wrote in his trip notes, in handwriting, in pencil, did not appear in his type notes, type report, did not appear in his letters home. He wrote in his trip notes that this is the most potentially powerful position in the world. Now, what in the world? This is 20 miles south of where Osama bin Laden was hiding. It was the, it was the gateway uh, to British invasion of India in the second and third um, Afghan wars. Um, Lowell Thomas used almost the same language in describing the, the Bolan Pass south of Quetta. But to, to see this, and I never, well, anyhow, so the southern part of the trip was very different, very different terrain, very different people. Uh, that guy could be there right now. Uh, the, the paintings, there were, there were many paintings in the original manuscript that I sent in that uh, were, were done by my father's friend, bridge partner, uh, uh, April Swain Thomas. Um, and they illustrate things that are, could not be because they're, they're color and the book is black and white, they're also their copyright of hers uh, that I just discovered. Wonderful Google leads you to things that you would never see otherwise. And there they are. That's the full picture at the end of the trip. I don't, it didn't take a picture of the party with the, uh, uh, the lawn party at the end of the trip in Quetta with the governor. There he is uh, taking a picture of Auchinleck in the center uh, holding a sepoy, uh, showing a sepoy how to hold a gun. Um, and uh, intelligence work continues. He did one other major uh, trip uh, on, on a camel, uh, which he uh, wrote up for Life magazine, and like his photographs, which were uh, purchased by the National Geographic, never, never made it into print. But it was a trip on a camel to find out what this thing was, and he found out it was actually from a Liberty ship, it was a life raft, and it must have washed overboard because I was able to look into the record of that Liberty ship, which had changed its name a couple of times, finished the war, and, uh, and so it was not a lost Liberty ship, and it was a thing. It was a thing. That was what British intelligence received from that place. And that is very close to where the Chinese port uh, is being built for the Pakistanis at, uh, I can't remember the name of the town, it begins with G, it was just a nothing town, but now it's of course a big, a big port that's going to be the Chinese entry into the Indian Ocean if all goes well for them. Uh, some other visitors who came through my father-in-law's place that uh, just many of them uh, were, were difficult to, to know, They're just friends of friends of friends, and, and my mother-in-law certainly knew them, but these two people were identified by name. That was a the, the beach is still there, and, and my father-in-law made many, many interesting trips there. Uh, this is uh, uh, to meet an excellency, the governor and Lady Dow, request the company of Lieutenant A.W. Zimmerman to meet the Viceroy, I think. Do you see that there? But can you, I think you can read it. I can't, I can't see it from here. But, it, but he did meet the Viceroy anyway at a garden party. And I can't help but wonder 
you know, he just mentioned it in passing in one of his letters. What did they talk about? He was a very close-mouthed fellow. That's, of course, one of the virtues of naval intelligence, uh, of an intelligence officer. There's some people who talk a lot, like uh, the Alsop brothers, you know, they were, they were married into the family, and they were, they were very talkative. They maintained their cover by pushing it away, by just talking all the time. My father-in-law just listened. Uh, the, the woman on the, on the left later became a baroness after her husband uh, inherited the title, and, then, and uh, she was just another bridge partner. There, oh, no, there she is on the right. The, and, and just among the many other pictures that he took, there are something like uh, 500 photos that, that I scooped up, some of them in albums, some of them in, in loose photos and so forth, all of them difficult to, to make copies of because they had to be flattened out, you know, they rolled up into little things like that, flatten them out, copy them, try again, try again. But among the copies there, there's um, Peachy's place. Peachy's mother was a friend of theirs. Peachy was one of the 12 OSS girls. Uh, the most famous of them was Julia McWilliams, later Julia Child, at Peachy's place in, uh, in Candy Salon, now Sri Lanka. And there's the entrance to Mountbatten's headquarters in Sri Lanka. Um, epilogue, after the war is over, both my father-in-law and mother-in-law got ulcers. Uh, difficult, difficult time. Uh, so he got early release from the Navy. But the war was winding down, you know. The Pacific War, uh, the Pacific War would be taken care of by people who were already in the Pacific and they were discharging naval intelligence officers who had been in, in the East and in Europe at that point. Anyhow, so we got TAD for courier duty. We don't know what he said. Uh, he was relieved at Karachi in April 1945, uh, returned to the US, uh, was hospitalized and then released. There they are after the war. My, that's one of the very few photographs of my mother, my mother-in-law. Uh, Jean Markey married twice more. I mentioned that Joan Bennett and, and um, uh, head of Namar before the war. He also, among his other exploits, was Wee Willie Winky. Taken, uh, Wee Willie Winky is Kipling's story set uh, on the Durand Line, set on the border. Of, uh, Wee Willie Winky is a kid uh, transformed into a girl by Shirley Temple. It's her first starring role. And this movie was produced by Gene Markey before the war. Now, after the war, that's, that's uh, Bull Halsey there on the left. He is the, bull, the, the best man when uh, Jean Markey married uh, the woman called the, the nicest girl in Hollywood, uh, Myrna Loy. And uh, then he later married Lucille Wright, who was fabulously wealthy. The, she was the widow who inherited the Calumet Farms. <coughs> now, Gordon Enders continued his career, and as a result of the article that I published in Appalachia about this, uh, I got a call from uh, a, a person who knew him. When, when the person who called me was a little boy, he knew Gordon Enders when he worked for the NSA. And he said that uh, Gordon Enders, and he gave me uh, all the information that I needed about connection with the rest of the Enders family. Uh, Bromhead, uh, you, you can see here, uh, finished the war, uh, was promoted, died, and uh, his son, who was born during the trip uh, that my father-in-law took, uh, is now eligible, if he would take it, to be the sixth baronet Bromhead. But he probably won't take it. It'll pass to somebody else. It's a very old title, and there are other, other males standing in line. These are uh, my father-in-law's uh, grandchildren. And uh, just to tell you something about them, let's see. Tim Zimmerman here, the, the fellow on the the right with the blue, with the blue sweater. Tim uh, is the producer of the of the of the movie Black Fish. That's now the movie about uh, the Sea World. That's a very very contentious movie. Um, she is married in the, the triangle up there, my, my, my son and the one to my son's right is, is uh, uh, married 
a fellow uh, who is the great-grandson of Lord Curzon. Small world. She, she died of leukemia. But uh, uh, Charlie Metcalf is the, is the grandson of Fruity Metcalf, who married Barbara, Barbara Curzon, Curzon. Fruity Metcalf was the pimp for uh, Prince Edward, who later became King Edward, when he came to Peshawar. And he wrote, I mean, he got the title for the Victorian or Royal Victorian Order, but, but, but uh, the, 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 the prince who you know from, from uh, Downton Abbey, you know, is a real skirt chaser through his whole life. And of course, he wound up having to resign as king because he couldn't stop chasing skirts. And even though his wife uh, was not loyal to him either, that was the way he did things. When, when as prince, he went to Peshawar, he wrote, a, he wrote back to, to, um, to Fruity Metcalf, who was then just a, just a, a, a lieutenant in the Indian Army, uh, thanks for that bitch at Peshawar. <laughs> thanks for that bitch at Peshawar, remember. <laughs> very, very, very strange world. Now, uh, some quotations here. The, the French, some of you can speak French, and so you probably w would do better at it than I can. I cannot, I cannot speak French. My wife reminds me that I should never try. But the, the word at the top means the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, I think in many ways, what we see right now about America in, in, in that uh, this, this trip was forgotten. All these messages, all the, everything that, that was learned there could have been useful, uh, was preempted by the national security strategy that I worked with when I was at the Pentagon and that everybody had to work with, the, the prime decision was Russia and Europe. Come across the Folder Gap, everything had to be done to, and everything else was secondary to that. Now, two people have reviewed the book and they say, I'm wrong, you know, we didn't ever forget about it. But they're, they're exhibiting what, what is called, uh, what Charles Thayer wrote in his book, localitis. That is to say, any place you are as a diplomat you think is the most important place in the world. And so these people uh, who wrote about it, and I really appreciate the, their very careful, uh, nice, nice reviews, but when they say that, that it didn't fall off our radar, it really, I think, did fall off the radar because I know what the national security doctrine was when I was at the Pentagon. I know what it is now. I have a copy of it right there. It's different now. It should be different, but uh, at, the, at the time, our list of priorities did not include that part of the world. And everybody had to be thinking. We are, we are instructed in the service to think of the national, national security strategy as what we're supposed to, each piece of the, the work is supposed to be done with. Anyhow, so uh, Tony Strather and, and uh, Rod Engert. For anybody who likes to uh, get Netflix, there are all these wonderful movies that it's almost like being there again. Kim has been done twice, We Willie Winky, it's, it's, it's incredible. Zulu, Gunga Din, so forth. That's it. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry I went overtime, John. I just didn't watch the clock. Any questions? Now, I'm an old man. I'm very deaf, so I need some help. You'll be my interlocutor in case I don't hear. How would you summarize the most important thing that they did learn on the trip? What is the most important thing um, for us to learn and or for my father-in-law to learn? What my father-in-law learned we don't know. He never, he never said. But I think what he learned is what I've said, which is that the British finally figured out that forward policy doesn't work. You don't need to be in Afghanistan to keep the Russians out of, of India. The Afghans will take care of it just fine. And of course, they, they, they showed that when the Russians spent 10 years trying to take Afghanistan. They just gave up. And it caused, was the final thing that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. Boom, 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 one after another. Once they pulled out of Afghanistan, everything unraveled. I think my father, father-in-law, he had, 
he had uh, many conversations, a few of them written down, about his conversations with British intelligence officers. And that was their position. Forward policy had tr been tried and failed. And now the present policy was to let the Afghans take care of the border. And I, I, don't, I don't doubt that he believed that that was true after he'd been there. question. Among the things I'm sure that he was looking for were Russians, Russian activities. There, there was a lot of, they were looking for Nazis, Italians, changed from one side to the other while he was on the trip. <laughs> and, and, and get the story of, of what happened. The Italians were the main operators there because the Italians were the most effective. The Gestapo, he mentioned, no, no. Some of this comes through in other ways, partly from the National Archives, reading State Department things, partly from Thayer's books. He wrote a whole lot of them, partly from my father's comments. But what we learn is that the, the Nazis were very ineffective. The Italians were really smooth and they were effective. The British were the, the, the Russians were supplying the Communist Party of India, and the Communist Party of India was supplying a man called the, sorry, can't remember it right now, but he, he was like, uh, he, he was a mullah, okay, and he, the British never were able to catch him, and, the, and he was out of control, and he was always, he was always um, Mir Ali, Mir Ali. He's, the, the, the Wikipedia tells you a lot about him, and you can go from that. Um, so he was seeing all these things. There were only two places that, that he mentioned Russia in all of his letters, all of his notes. One was the, the difficulty that the Kazakhs had. There were Kazakhs that were in the south, and they were going back uh, north. Now, they were going back north in the wintertime. That meant that there had to have been a change, because ordinarily they would take their crop, their animals south in the winter, but they were going north. And so there was, there was no Russian activity, never saw a bit of it, but I'm sure that he was looking for it. The other thing that appeared in um, Charles Thayer, just amazingly, at the same time, Thayer came out of, Thayer, Thayer was ordered out of, of Kabul at this time and at Christmas, same, same month my father-in-law got back to Karachi, Thayer came down from, from Karachi went around and back up to England where he, uh, he joined the American Embassy, became a member of the OSS then, and then went back to Yugoslavia uh, as the chief of mission. And Thayer describes being in eastern Afghanistan at that particular moment that my father was on just across the border. They, didn't, they probably talked about it when they saw each other, but my father-in-law never wrote about it, of course. He was looking for bear. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bear throughout all of his books means the Russians. He was not looking for the Russian bear. Bears and caviar, various other things that the titles of his book tell me that that particular hunt for the bear was that he was looking for Russians. But he never found any, I think. They were not there. It was a long answer. <laughs> 